So welcome to another interview with Sylvain TNT Minot. And today is actually the closing date of Tiny Tape Out 4. Um, so we're just taking some time out between waiting for the long running actions and so on uh, to do a quick interview and talk about what has changed since our last chat. So hi, Sylvain, welcome. Hey, hi, Matt, and thank you for uh, having me. Yeah. Um, so we, when we, we've done two previous videos, so I'll link them up above. Um, and the first one was about the difference between uh, Tiny Tape Out 1, 2, and 3 and uh, onwards, which is basically a, a slow skir serial scan chain versus a fast mux. So if you want to find out more about that and the design, that's in the first video. And then in, in the second video that we did, the last one, that was more about uh, the implementation into standard cells, um, talking about how to keep things from changing between runs, um, the hardware abstraction layer so we can plug it into other PDKs in the future um, and measuring um, the delays and trying to get an understanding of how fast things are going to be. And now at the uh, on the day of, um, well, it's not actually, we've got, we're going to be taping it on Monday, but we're halting submissions today. Um, we're pretty much ready to go though, because uh, we're so well prepared. <laughs> Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and so now we can talk about um, your experience with Open Lane 2, the hardening process, um, how the routing was done, like the die placement, P power distribution network, things like this. So uh, maybe we can kick it off with Open Lane 2. How has it been using Open Lane 2? Yeah, so um, I definitely had a better experience with Open Lane 2 than. Open Lane One. No, it might be because I used Open Lane One very early on and not necessarily the, the later version. But all the stuff that I like to do is, is usually, um, you know, customizing various uh, parts of the process and things like that. And Open Lane One didn't especially make that very easy. Uh, but here with Open Lane Two, because you kind of you kind of describe the entire flow in Python, it's very easy to insert like custom steps and stuff like that. And especially here for um, for tiny tape out, we we inject custom steps for um, mostly routing and placement uh, of IOs uh, and that kind of stuff. And it's very easy to just take the standard flow and then you know between two existing step, plug in a small open DB script that allows you to um, with a Python script and using the open DB Python binding uh, modify you design to place some cell, root some nets, and uh, and that kind of stuff. Um, I mean, given that Open Lane 2 is also, I mean, it, at least it was in alpha when we, when yes, we in started. Beta now. <laughs> yes, in Yes, exactly. Um, there has been definitely some some uh, some bumps uh, along the way, but uh, mm. the main developer Don has, has always been very helpful. Yeah, uh, in Thanks, Don. Yeah, helping us, uh, yeah, navigating through them. Uh, we've also been uh, hit uh, a couple of times, like bugged, not so much in Open Lane 2, but in Open Road itself, which Open Lane 2 obviously depends heavily on. Mm. Um, but again, most of the time we got them, fix them quickly. Uh, you know, once you get a, a small reproducible design that you can send to the developer to say, okay, like this is this doesn't work, why? Uh, usually they they're pretty fast at uh, fixing the issues that uh, that we've had. So. In general, I've, I've had a, a pretty good experience with uh, Open Lane 2 in general, and mm -hmm. I think I think definitely Tiny Tape Out would have been much a much more painful experience if we had to do it without it. I think. Yeah, I think probably now maybe we can talk a little bit about one of the custom steps, the routing, and mm -hmm. and just one of the reasons we didn't want to use the auto router was because we want deterministic timing. So after we've done the layout one time, we're always going to get the same result. Um, yes. And also uh, um, we do a much better job or your script does a much better job of uh, getting everything in really close together compared to leaving the auto router, which does some pretty crazy things. Do you want to talk a little bit about how you um, handled the routing and maybe show us a picture? Okay, so this is a um, typical view of all the layers in a, a taped out. Um, tiny tape out that is full of projects, like it's a hundred percent full. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to hide some layers so that we can see a little bit more. Let me hide all and just show um, metal four, for instance. 
uh, metal three and metal five. Okay. So the first thing you notice is like at the obviously you have like all the projects here, and if you look mm -hmm. at the if we zoom a little bit, you can you can clearly see that you have all the blocks here that represent the actual user project, uh, and then you have the long block here, which is the the max. Mm -hmm. uh, here in the center, you have the controller, which basically aggregates the signal from all the marks and uh, then redirects them to the I.O. And here in the middle, like in blue, you can see the spine. And the spine contains first all the signals that are coming to and from the maxes, mm -hmm. and also all the signals going to the I.O. So if we look at, uh, at just this, for instance, you can see that it's a very regular structure. If you look at uh, the way they're connected here, I need to actually show the via for that. Uh, via four. No, sorry, via three. Okay. Yeah. You can see here the the connection to the mux here, and you can see that you know every time it's a perfect uh, right angle connecting connected to traces that are about as close as they can be horizontally. Vertically, we left a little bit of space just to try to diminish coupling between traces and because, yeah, we figured that might be worth it. And also it helps meeting the DRC for the vias and stuff like that. Uh, but you can see that as far as the spine routing is, is concerned, it's pretty uh, ideal in the sense mm -hmm. that you can't really do shorter. First, that helps the router converge, well, way faster. Um, and um, because with that kind of density, the router just wouldn't work at all. Like, I don't know, you can probably insert a, an image of the, the picture you read it when you did the test for uh, Tiny Tepa 3.5, where he tried to use the auto router mm -hmm. for even just two muxes, and like it was routing signals all over the place. Like, if you, if you don't use custom routing, this thing gives up, like, it, after, it will try for an hour and then just give up. Um, that's for the connection between the muxes and uh, the controller. Um, originally, I wasn't. I was only planning on doing those manually and le leave the rest for the auto router. But it turned out that the the auto router, auto router still had trouble connecting. Basically, you know, every the controller needs to connect to the I/O cell and, uh, and the I/O pads and the I/O pads there on the on the side here. You can't see them because they're on metal two. Uh, so here, for example, for instance, are the connection for the I/O pads. Mm -hmm. You know, different ones and stuff like that. And originally, I left the auto router do that, but we we encountered some issue where it. First, it wouldn't find a solution at all, and sometimes it would find a solution, or at least the detailed router was somehow convinced it had a solution, but then it would fail DSC because it actually routed a wire over some pre-existing wire, which obviously isn't good. Um, so in the end, I, I also ended up routing them like uh, manually. And so you can see like these are typically IO and you can see that's been manually routed. Yeah. Um, the connection for the MUX and stuff is like fully automatic. Like the script figures out everything depending on the configuration of the number of tile that you want and stuff like that. The connection for the I.O., I ended up doing it a little bit of dirty way um, where I have a, a data file that basically specifies how I want it routed, um, which I did manually. So it would need changing for different PDK and stuff like that. But it was the question of, you know, OK, at the moment, it's good enough. And we're, we're in targeting we, we Sky 130. Exactly. If we if we if we need more later, we can we can do it. But uh, mm -hmm. it it took like uh, all of thirty minutes to do the data file, so it's not a a huge job. Yeah, looks um, good. And the yeah. um, connection between the um, the muxes and the user projects is that a the auto router can uh, do that. Yes, uh, those are auto routed. Uh, the connection between these uh, they auto routed, but they're we've basically aligned the like if we don't let me. If we just look at the pin area, mm -hmm. uh, there should be a metal four pins. You can see that basically the, okay, this is the mux, this is the user block. And we've made sure that connection exactly one <laughs> for one. Should be pretty straightforward, right? 
perfectly aligned. And yeah. so should just be Ruto, perfectly straight lines. Everyone. Exactly. Yeah. And the Ruto, Ruto thankfully managed to figure that out. Cool. Um, I did see some little wiggles going on in there, though. Uh, I mean, th there are some wiggles on the on that side. Look, so if you look at the metal for drawing. Like you see wiggles like yeah. here, for instance, yeah. but in theory, between blocks, that okay. should be straight. Always straight, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. All right. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. That's good to know. So I think uh, concerning, so, so that's actually the other kind of, because one of the typical custom script we have is the custom routing, which is mostly for the, um, the top level. Mm -hmm. But we also have custom script for the, when we uh, do the the mux, for instance, or when we do the controller, and that's actually not for routing itself, but just to place the I/O, basically, so that we okay, um, so that the I/O end up being placed at exactly the spot we want, and they aligned on the grid, and they will match between the mux and the user mm -hmm. block, and that kind of stuff. Great. Um, and talking of the muxes and hardening the muxes, uh, were you mm -hmm. able to? place the standard cells where you wanted to? Because that was something we mentioned in the second video was not yes. leaving the standard cells so, to just be placed anywhere. Uh, I, I haven't really gotten to it. Honestly, I didn't expect it to be able to root and find a placement that worked automatically. Mm -hmm. I thought the mux would end up being too dense for that. Yeah. Uh, it turned out that it worked and that the placement wasn't crazy like when you look at where it does stuff like it's not perfect or perfectly aligned but it's it's also not catastrophic uh so at the moment the the placement of the cells inside the mux is uh, left to the auto placer and the auto router as well actually mm -hmm. um it's an optimization that we can do in the future if there is a need to especially if we're trying to more closely match every signal you know so that io0 has the exact same delay as io1 that yeah. kind of that kind of thing. That's something we can look into. But at least for tiny tap out zero four, the uh, there is no such thing. Uh, we only place the I/O. Cool. Okay. Good. Um, one of the other things you worked on was the automatic placement of the user projects. <clears throat> yes. So there's basically a um, a Python script that. Given a configuration, you know, you tell him, okay, uh, I want um, a grid of, I think here we have 24 uh, high by 16 wide, if I'm correct, is that it? Yeah, we have, we have 16 project wide and 24 high, mm -hmm. and it will actually compute automatically all the dimensions of, you know, what is the dimension of the user block? Uh, what is the dimension of the max? What is the position of each block? That kind of stuff. Um, and basically generate all, all of that automatically so that if we decide that, okay, we don't want 384 project, but we want 256 or something like that, but we want them to be larger, we can easily change that with, with uh, minimal effort. <clears throat> and it will actually regenerate also like the, the DEF template that we give to the user to so that their project matches the dimension and the pin position, that kind of stuff. Um, but then also like every every position, like here all the blocks are actually, you know, single tile, but mm. obviously we offer the, the possibility to have, you know, a dual width or dual height or up to eight by two blocks that would take like an entire, like an entire zone like this, something mm -hmm. like that. Um, and there's of course the, the question of, okay, we need to place them somewhere in that grid. Um, and and so there is like just a, a quick YAML file where you just list all the projects that you want placed, the dimension it has, and it will just basically try to find the placement uh, that fits the various um, constraint, which is mostly like blocks must not overlap. Yeah. Um, and uh, and give you the, uh, the address and, that's actually, I mean, I'm not actually sure if uh, if Yuri ended up using that exactly or if he has a customized version of it because the the app.tt uh, app tiny, tiny type out slash tt slash zero four um, shows a placement that's not 100% consistent with that placer. So he might have customized that for okay. for some, some reason. But the idea is that given a list of blocks, we don't have to manually 
play some. Uh, yeah, exactly. There was a minimal amount of manual work involved in adding a new project to the grid, basically. Yeah. That was the... And as it, as it moves around, its address will change, right? So yes, we'll, yes. we need to wait for the final thing that we uh, commit to and tape out before we'll know all the addresses for all the separate projects. Exactly. Great. And, um, yeah, so the routing that was done as a custom pass in Open Lane 2, um, what else was done as custom passes? I mean, the, the, the only other custom pass is, uh, as I said, the placement of the I.O. on okay. the block. Uh, then we also kind of customize the flow um, in the sense that we remove passes we don't want and that kind of stuff. Like, uh, But that's as far as... Like DRC um, and LVS, that can go out the window. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, those we have option to disable them when we iterate, but uh, <laughs> we did. Uh, that's, that was actually one of the bugs that, uh, yeah... Um, that was figured out by Uris. Uh, it's like uh, making LVS actually work mm. um, in our case. Uh, but no, but for instance, like, you know, when we generate the DEF template for the block, it actually goes through the flow, but with most of the step removed, we basically mm. just do a layout and then yeah. take the DEF output with nothing in, in it. And then we provide that as a template that's actually done as a, as a classic open lane build with just 90% of the pass disabled. It's really cool seeing so such an efficient use of space because it's like if you look back to my first tape out um, with everything really strewn around and then my second one where I was I think we had 16 projects that were 300 by 300 so it was like more than half the space was wasted and then tiny tape out one two and three we packing a lot of designs in but there was still probably nearly 50% space wasted. And now, do you, I mean, do, do you have an idea of what, what that number is now? It's just uh, little, the, effi margin, the efficiency, it? yeah, it's it's very little because like if we look at the space that is left mm. between the block, it's it's really narrow. Yeah, because um, you've got the IO pins that have got to be in there somewhere as well, right? Yes, yes. So if you look at the IO pin, they're there. So that's basically the um, the limit of the block. It's, mm. it's basically here. Uh, because it, it goes to the edge. Now each uh, user block, yes, I think in the in the default configuration, or at least in the configuration I'm using now, I just leave one um, mm. cell of margin there. And then there is one cell of margin that is left by the tiny tape out framework by itself so that it can actually root some signal. Because if you look, there's nothing going on. Wait, uh, actually, if I show metal three. Yeah, if you look, there is actually some metal tra three traces that go in there. That's the connection mm. to the I.O. We need to actually get them f to the controller up, and then it needs to pass somewhere between the blocks to reach the pins that are the I.O. Mm. just right here, right? So it's very, um, it's a Smart. very nar narrow space. Yeah, it's very, mm. it's very... Uh, <laughs> Efficient. It's like, exactly, exactly. Beautiful. <laughs> I mean, th these, as I said, we could compact them more, but that wouldn't win. As yeah, we did I have. A, we had some comments from um, Eric yes. who was saying about uh, don't want things too close because otherwise you're going to get um, like exactly. issues with um, parasitics and signal yeah. lines affecting each other. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so it's it's already an unknown. So. Yeah. All right, so let's move on and talk a little bit about um, the timing side of things. Were you able to get any further with? Um, STA and getting um, more solid numbers on the input and output delay? Uh, yes and no. So I definitely made a lot of progress uh, on um, doing the STA at several levels. First, at the, at the sub-block level, which is analyzing basically the MUX by itself and analyzing the, uh, the controller by itself. So what I had to do was kind of backward is that I first they ran kind of the parasitic extraction for the top level. And that kind of gave me an estimate of, okay, what can I expect the capacitive load, for instance, of the outputs here to be connected to and that kind of stuff. So that, you know, when you come, when you do the, the STA for that sub block, I would say, or the MUX mm -hmm. sub block, you need to somehow model realistically 
what it's connected to. What is driving, yeah. Exactly, because mm -hmm. uh, either it's driving a very uh, small connection, like if it's driving the user block, it's very close, there is not yeah. much there, and, and chances are the user block has a single or, or a couple of buffers connected to the line that's very light. But if it's uh, an output connected to the... Um, One of these really long the, wires. To, to the spine, yeah. Not only does it have like a bunch of capacitors because it needs to drive super long wires, but it also needs to drive, uh, to charge like the... The whole wire. Output capacitance mm. of the other buffers on that line. Yeah. For instance, that kind of stuff. So a, uh, so I did like a, a top level um, analysis, which I knew would be wrong timing wise, but that hopefully the parasitic extraction would provide me some, some useful numbers. And then I was able to uh, start uh, analysis there. Actually, let me try to share the, the file for this. Um, okay. So if we look at the SDC that we that I use for the the, the TT Mux, uh, for instance, um, you can see that it's important to uh, basically specify what kind of input you expect. Uh, here you're basically specifying specifying sorry the 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 slew time that you expect on your input. So for instance, I say okay, like the the transition at the input. Uh, that come from the user modules, they're mm -hmm. gonna be very fast. Is this nanoseconds? Yeah, yeah, it's nanosecond here. Uh, everything that comes from the spine, uh, probably not so much, right? Because it's- These it's long driven, wires. It's long wires and stuff like that. And then again, like, okay, what is the uh, the capacitance that I expect in, in a picofarad, I think? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, very small for everything that goes to the user module, but uh, like the spine is very capacitive. Uh, here I've estimated it to like one, uh, one pico farad, something like that. Um, so that's where you specify what you expect in your input output. I kind of skipped the beginning, but the beginning is just basically classifying the signal into different classes so that you don't have to refer to them one by one. Uh, and then you basically just set the constraint that you want. Now, mm -hmm. obviously this, because we have disabled most of the resizing and automatic stuff and stuff like that so that we have consistent results, um, setting targets here will not actually influence the result. It will just test whether you, you've met, met those or, not. or mm -hmm. not. And most importantly, once you have a, a constraint set on one path, it will actually be included in the report because if you if if your path is unconstrained, it doesn't even analyze it, so you don't know what it's doing and stuff like that. Uh, so, for instance, here I uh, I just specified that okay, um, anything that is control, which is basically you know selecting the design or anything, yeah, it doesn't matter. Slow. Stuff like that. It, mm. it doesn't really matter the delay. So I've set mm. like seventeen point five. Um, and the user I/O, we have like some uh, title constraint, and in particular, you can see that anything that's input is much faster. So uh, anything that comes from the outside to the user modules is actually fairly fast. If I have constrained it to 2.5 nanoseconds, um, simply because the input path doesn't contain any tri-state or stuff like that. Tri-state tends to be to slow things down. Mm -hmm. um, while for the input pass, it's just a buffer, basically, sometimes with an end gate so that we can zero it, but mm -hmm. it's most it's mostly buffer all the way and a, and a final end gate. Uh, so that's relatively quick. But the output, of course, involves uh, tri-state and tri-state driving long uh, capacitive lines. That's a bad recipe for timing. So here I've limited it to uh, 8.5 milliseconds. I honestly not entirely sure if it met, I think it met those uh, in the And where did those corner. numbers come from? Did you kind of- Those, uh, but basically I just put 10 milliseconds everywhere. Then I mm -hmm. ran it and then I came up with something that I thought was reasonable. I mean, depending on the numbers, either I was satisfied with what it was Mm -hmm. I figured, okay, like there is not much way I can improve that, so I'm just gonna shoot slightly above. Like you know, if the input pass was two nanoseconds, I would put a constraint to two point five, so that I know it's not gonna get much worse if I do changes like that. Uh, if the numbers were not satisfactory, then I look, okay, uh, where can I resize things, change things, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually, you can you can actually see in the in the history, like if you look at the 
in the history, um, you will see a bunch of things where I added, you know, add buffering, uh, add buffering because I those signals they, I wasn't satisfied with this with their timing, and I I looked at okay where is time lost where uh, mm -hmm. where can I improve things and uh, I modified the code to try to to improve the uh, the timing for for those particular paths. So let me just um, see if I get this. So you run the you run STA, you get some results back. You look at them and you think, okay, that is kind of what I was expecting. That's fine. And then you just set the the bounds a bit higher. So if it ever goes above that, it will fail. The, exactly, when you run yeah. it as a test, and then yeah. anything that looks too slow or you think you can improve, then you think, okay, well, let's replace this two times strength buffer for a four times strength buffer. Run it again and see if I make an impact. Yeah, basically that's it. Cool. Okay. Um, so that was so we're, for the, so that we're looking at kind of um, two and a half in and eight and a half out. That's pretty good, isn't it? Uh, well, yes and no, because that's only the TT max, right? That's only, okay, that's, only right. that's only the, not the entire by itself. path. All right. That's not the entire path. Uh, so that's that's something that you need to to take into account. Uh, and also, it's typical corner because. So if you do the worst case analysis, the worst case analysis is really, really worst case, right? It's mm. several orders of magnitude slower simply because they test, you know, I think powered at like 1.6 volt or 1.65 volt or something like that mm -hmm. at a hundred degree in the slow, slow process corner. <laughs> and so that can that can end up easily two or three times slower than the yeah. typical yeah. one. Obviously, uh, no. if you're making a car or a spaceship. Yeah, exactly. But hopefully we can provide, you know, slightly tire, uh, tighter tolerance on what kind of power supply we provide. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously the power supply we provide externally might not reflect what's actually um, ends up at the cell, right? Because there's higher drops and stuff drop. like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, stuff like that. Hopefully the power grid that we have is... Um, That's actually is, next, is on the, um, next on the list of yeah. topics. So <laughs> we'll get to that in a minute. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, there, I won't hide that there's definitely a bunch of unknowns, right, on, on, mm -hmm. on Tiny Tape Art, uh, but uh, but the, the hope is that we we covered our basis enough so that we can get something that is uh, definitely useful. Definitely, I mean, I have no doubt that it's it not going to be hard to, to improve than, on than Tiny Tape Art Three, is it? <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. Um, I think we're definitely no, three orders of magnitude. There is, yes, there is definitely some some things that I think we can improve in, in future ones. It's something I, I uh, mentioned. Like, a, let me see if I can actually find um, a run of this. Uh, so and this is a nice um, open lane two thing where you get a name next to each. To each step, yes, yes. You can you can look at the design as it progress, and you have like mm -hmm. uh, checkpoints and stuff like that, which is yeah, really nice. So here, start with PNR. If I'm looking at nominal here, and I look at the Uh, I'm trying to find something that in, involves the uh, the tri-state buffer. Z buff. Yeah, I, I'm. I should search for E buff. Right. Okay. So this. Okay, yeah, this this for instance. Uh, yeah. You can see that the the final the um, you got two two levels of tri-state buffer. You know, you have like the horizontal one, so like the values block they drive the same line that goes across the mox mm -hmm. uh, to the spine, and that is uh, that is a tri-state buff, but it's not a very long line and there is not that many things on it so if you look at if you look at it it's not 
that's set with this buffer, so that's this line. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely not like super speedy, but you know, yeah. we, we're talking like 0 0.7 slow, mm -hmm. uh, slow 0 0.7 uh, delay. It's it's nothing that uh, that is not acceptable at least. Uh, when we look uh, here at the one that drives the spine, we have like a four nanosecond slew and a nearly three nanosecond delay. And that's yeah. the typical corner. If you look at the worst case corner, it's oh, uh, I think it's up to eight nanoseconds and six nanoseconds of delay. So this is getting very um, slow, definitely more than I would like, especially since it's only the local analysis. It's actually slightly worse when you look at the top level analysis. Uh, so, but the thing is, like, we only have uh, the, the maximum strength we have for an e buff is eight. Eight, and eight times, yeah. Yeah, and we don't have a sixteen version of that. Uh, and the the way I see to improve that timing uh, there is possibly design our own cell is to have a e buff twelve or, or sixteen, mm -hmm. which uh, which should help. And the other is to simply um, split the tiny tape out in two and then have like a, currently the spine does the whole height yeah and we could split it in the upper and lower part so that we basically half the capacitance which is gonna mm. help the slow and the delay uh, very much and i think the combination of both of these should allow us to reduce drastically those numbers even in the worst case scenarios basically yeah um okay great um so uh, we're still kind of shooting for around um, total delay of, a, of input to output of around 20 nanoseconds. Do I remember that right? Yes, yes. That's, I think that's reasonable for the typical corner, at least, mm -hmm. uh, even with the, the number I've, I've got from the, um, from the top level, that, that should be reasonable. One big unknown is like, what is the impact of slew? Mm. Uh, of slew rate, like because we have some some very slow slew rate, um, and that could drive up power consumption, right? Yeah, I mean there is a concern about noise, so that the the signal could um, kind of oscillate in the, uh, at the transition period, uh, which would be mostly a problem for clock. Um, but thankfully, because the you know the tri-state buffer are only in the output direction, mm -hmm. you know, from the user module to the outside. Uh, that's not much a concern for like the, the clock input and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, that's, uh, so I think we should, um, we should be fine. Uh, of course, it's based on the parasitic extraction from OpenSX. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll have to see if that matches uh, with what other tools uh, can provide us. Uh, and if we can double check that with, well, yeah, other tools and reality when we actually get to this. Yeah, one. yeah. <laughs> um, and just uh, to rem uh, remind people watching, because um, you might be thinking, well, why are they using tri-states? The reason we're using tri-states on the output is because is to avoid a huge amount of extra routing that would be very difficult to fit in otherwise. Yes, yes, definitely. Um, I mean, we've check, always... Check the first video if you want to get more information about the, yeah. um, why the design decisions around the actual structure of the MUX. Okay. Um, well, we're... we're uh, this is uh, more, longer and more in, in detail than I uh, <laughs> was planning, but I'm really interested. Um, what about um, power distribution? That's That came up earlier, and I wouldn't mind... Um, wouldn't mind taking a look. Is it was that um, something? Were you able to get the PDN to work kind of out of the box, or is that another custom pass? No. Uh, so it was. Uh, it's not a custom pass. It's just custom configuration of okay. the uh, the existing path. So um, there are different levels. Uh, okay. So if we look at just the PDN first of the Muxes, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, I do the layer and just show metal four. Okay. Uh, for the mux, it's, there's actually not much special. We just the, those are just the the, the stripes, and they are uh, pretty much the, the default configuration. Actually, the, the more interesting is in the controller because if we look. Yeah. All the spine has to go through, like yeah. above the controller, basically, yeah. right? Without conflicting. And so 
we actually have like a, a custom uh, PDN configuration that's generated automatically that will first leave a gap in the middle here so that we can fit the, the PDN uh, network for the controller. And then we'll fit it, we'll adjust the PDN of the, the controller itself so that it fits exactly there and uh, there on the side um, without conflicting. Of course, we could not have left a gap and just put one here and one here, but I just figured, okay, three is better than two and better be safe and, uh, and provide as much uh, power connection as, uh, mm -hmm. as possible. For the top level, uh, that's all on metal five. And hmm. again, it's just a custom configuration that's automatically adapted depending on the, the, you know, the grid size you've selected and that kind of stuff. But it will try to place uh, two rails over oh, yeah, each user nice. module yeah. and then one over the max, basically. Yeah. So yeah, like you can see them here, you have two yeah. going over the user module and then for the mux and then this basically all along. And if you have, uh, uh, of course, user modules that are um, higher, they will end up having four. Like a two by two, like they get more. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. You can see the connection here and here, for instance. Um, so there is, I mean, the mux only have one power rails going through them, mm -hmm. um, but I mean, the IA drop report doesn't seem to complain about it, so. Yeah, I wonder how accurate that is. Yeah, I mean, uh, because the thing is, despite the fact that the, the MUX is kind of a large block, mm -hmm. one thing you have to consider is that most of that block actually does absolutely nothing, right? Uh, because like, uh, it's connected to 16 block, but one sixteenth, uh, only one sixteenth of the logic is actually is actually doing time. anything. Yeah. The rest yeah. is doing is doing nothing. So nothing. It, it, I think that should be uh, that should be fine. Yeah, and it's also um, there's actually very little logic inside, which means that most of it is actually decoupling cells. Mm. So great. Okay, and um, it's been mostly Uri that's been doing the. The top level stuff, or have you been more? Inv have you been involved in that as well? Uh, what do you mean by top level stuff? The, like the final hardening. Yes, yes. Uh, Uri has basically been taking the the user designs and uh, and integrating them and, and dealing with the GitHub actions stuff like that. I just mm -hmm. check that it works for me basically on the yeah. filled with like demo uh, the demo projects thing yeah. exactly, and then the, he takes the user designs checks that, uh, integrates them, check that it hardens uh, through the GitHub action, submits that to ifabless yeah. e and check that it does go through the various checks yeah. that ifabless e yeah. has. Um, on and there. yeah, every week we run it through their submission system to check that they, we haven't included something that breaks there. Yeah. Um, yes, and I was just checking out the number of um, actions that have run on that repo now and it's up to 1,200. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and they're not small. They're, they're... They no, tend to take them. a while. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's all looking good. I'm, I'm very pleased with the way that things are working with the GitHub action. And then the, the GDS is um, from there directly submitted. So eFabless have a new submission system now where we can, uh, you create a repository um, in, their, in their kind of version of GitHub. And then the only thing you need to really put in there is the the final files, so we just push them and rerun the, the jobs. Yes. Simple. Yeah, okay, so I think I think that's good. It's good to leave it there. Um, uh, we had a little, is there anything else you want to mention? Uh, no, I think I've covered pretty much um, everything I have for now, at least. Yeah, um, and uh, we talked a little bit about future improvements, like slight tightening up on the timing and stuff like that. Is there, is there any kind of like big thing that you would like to address in the future? Uh, not really. The, the more, so the, the the biggest improvement that I would like to see more quickly is first, yeah, for the timing is um, splitting and then possibly uh, strengthening the, the output buffer for... Um, for this, so to improve the timing of the outward signals. 
Uh, and then I think the next step would be thinking about the power gating thing. Hmm. Basically. Yeah, that would be good. Then we can accept analog and yeah. GDS from other tools and so on. Yeah. So maybe um, we'll see whether any of that's going to be ready for Tiny Tape Out 5. So Tiny Tape Out 5 is going to be early, early November. We actually just slightly pushed it back one day so that people who come to these, the Hackaday Supercon workshop could submit to Tiny Tape Out <laughs> 5 if they get a design ready in one day. So that would be amazing. Um, so yeah, the schedule for Saturday, November the 4th. So if you're interested in taking part in a future Tiny Tape Out, uh, then check out the website. And um, thanks again, Sylvan, for all your uh, help on this and uh, Thank you for explaining me. how it's all working. <laughs>